Hello everybody and a happy Halloween. So of course we could not do the Halloween season without talking about Eliza Lamb and the Cecil Hotel. But first, before we get into that video, I want to quickly have a word from our sponsor, and today our sponsor is Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a unique true crime subscription box service. They send you a box every month full of different clues, and over the course of a season, you have to put together the evidence and the clues and what you know and solve a murder. Now, Hunt a Killer is coming out with a new season really soon. So if you've been thinking about signing up, you've been interested in it, now is the time to check it out because you can get in right when the season starts and be following along with everybody, including myself. Also remember that the holiday season is coming up. We're nearing the end of October now. So if you're trying to figure out something to get the person in your life who kind of has everything and usually gets whatever they want anyways, which feels like it's every single person in my life, or if you're looking for something to suggest to other people to get you for Christmas, Hunt a Killer is a perfect gift. It's a perfect idea, a perfect unique kind of present for somebody to show that you actually know who they are and what they're interested in instead of just giving them a gift card to Target, even though a gift card to Target is pretty sweet too. And remember, Hunt Killer is so much fun when played by yourself, but so much more fun when you play with a friend. If you're interested in trying Hunt Killer and getting 20% off of your first box, please go in the description box and click on the link and try it out for yourself. You won't be disappointed, I promise. Let's get started on the video. Okay, Elisa Lam. Whew, Elisa Lam. This is a big one. This is one that's been all over the internet. This is one that so many people have found themselves obsessed with. There's a lot of good content out there about Elisa Lam, and there's some content out there that's kind of inflammatory almost or suggestive. It kind of reminds me of the Kanika Jenkins case in the way that people take all of these little things and kind of turn them into bigger things or they'll take a detail and stretch as far as they possibly can to get to a conclusion on that detail. So you have to be careful when you're watching stuff about Elisa Lam. Somebody who does a really good job on YouTube with the Elisa Lam case is John Lorden. Now I used a lot of John Lorden's videos for this case. I even spoke to him on the phone about the case because he knew so much about it. So if you are interested in learning more after this video or you want to check into specific areas of the case, John Lorden has a whole Elisa Lam playlist and I will link it in the description box. Once again, this was a case that I went into expecting to quickly be able to prove what happened. Even though I know it's fun to speculate about things online, I can usually tell when I look at a case whether things have just been exaggerated for the point of dramatic effect. And obviously in this case that happened. But what I also discovered is there are a lot of questions that are unanswered and there are a lot of crazy coincidences and connections that you don't normally see in these types of cases. This case has confused and haunted anyone who knows about it. Even the most logical people who are able to debunk every ounce of anything supernatural in other cases like this, they have a hard time leaving their research and unequivocally knowing what happened or having a reasonable explanation for what happened. And I really do believe to understand why the Elisa Lam case is so enormous and blew up to such crazy proportions, you have to understand where she died, which was the Cecil Hotel. So let's talk a little bit about the Cecil Hotel first. Today, it's called the Stay on Main, and it's located in downtown Los Angeles at 640 South Main Street, just steps away from LA's Skid Row. The term Skid Row, or Skid Road, originated as a way to describe the way loggers used to transport their logs to the river by sliding them down greased skids on the streets. The logger would then wait at the bottom of the hill for transportation back up to the logging camp. Since the men sliding these logs down to the river to help construct the railroads were typically poor immigrants, and new businesses in the area would pop up to cater to their needs, like speakeasies and brothels, Skid Row became a term that law enforcement used to describe areas in the city where people with no money and nothing to do gathered and lived. The area in LA covers 50 city blocks east of downtown LA and contains one of the largest stable populations of homeless people in the United States. Los Angeles is currently in the midst of what has been called a homeless crisis, and in my opinion, it seems that the crisis is less about how many people have encountered life situations which have left them homeless, and more about how the non-homeless population of the city don't like the presence of these homeless people. 
Skid Row literally looks like a neighborhood filled with tents, garnished by barbecue grills and bicycles. They're supposed to disassemble their tents during the day, but the city has a hard time enforcing this policy. And if you guys have been following me on social media, like Instagram or Twitter, you would know that I went to Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago, and I saw for myself the state of the homeless population in the city. Essentially, what happens is these people have no place to live, right? So they have to live in tents, or basically whatever structure that they can find. They'll erect their tents at night so they have a place to sleep, but the city of Los Angeles expects that by the time the sun rises, they should disassemble their homes, basically, and, and move on, or just disappear and not be seen during the day so it doesn't bother the tourists or the uh, pedestrians who are walking, they're not trying to walk around tents. It's just a really bad situation. I understand why the city wouldn't want the tents just hanging out in the streets, but I also understand how difficult it is for somebody who faces these circumstances to have to basically pick up their entire life every morning and then just wander until the sun sets again. Historically, it seems like the way the LAPD and the city's politicians have handled the people of Skid Row is to arrest them and try to chase them off but they have nowhere to go, so when the dust is settled or they get let out of jail, they go right back. LA tried to rehabilitate the area by clearing out the abandoned buildings and getting rid of the decayed buildings, and eventually, in the 70s, the city just gave up and declared that the Skid Row area was an official containment zone where the city's homeless population would be tolerated. In September of 2005, it was discovered that the city's law enforcement and hospitals had essentially been dumping people in Skid Row who were down on their luck and had no place else to go. So they were just adding to the homeless population of this area. So LA was basically like, we don't want homeless people, get out of here homeless people. And then they were like, ugh, no matter what we do, they're still homeless people. So we'll just make a containment zone as if they were infected and throw them in this containment zone. And anyone we come across who can't pay for their medical bills or seems like they are on a bad path, we're just gonna dump them in there too. I just feel like it would be so much easier and cause the city so much less frustration if they could just find a way to build shelters for these homeless people and to care for them, maybe rehabilitate them. Thus allowing the citizens of LA to feel more comfortable when walking down the streets so they don't have to see the sadder side of life and it can give some of these homeless residents a chance to possibly move on with their life. The Cecil Hotel was built in 1924 by a man named William Banks Hanner, who worked alongside Lloyd Lester Smith, an architect, for almost a decade. The two men envisioned an opulent hotel where wealthy businessmen would lounge in its lobby and bar. They made the building as tall as was legally allowed in those days and decorated the inside in the Renaissance Revival style. Nothing but the best materials were used for this hotel marble in the lobby, alabaster statues throughout, and stained glass on the windows. And in fact, after it opened in 1927 and through the 1940s, the Cecil was a destination for high-class travelers and visitors to the city. But after the Great Depression, LA saw an influx of men headed west to try and improve their circumstances, and many of them ended up on Skid Row. Slowly, the area turned into a place that a self-respecting businessman would not feel safe venturing into, and as a result, the Cecil changed as well. It stayed a hotel, but they could no longer charge luxury rates. In order to keep the doors open, they had to basically open the doors to anyone who could afford to pay the very low nightly rate they'd been forced to charge. Instead of well-dressed businessmen lounging in the lobby and sipping martinis at the bar, prostitutes, drug addicts, and criminals called the Cecil their home. But what the Cecil is most famous for nowadays is being the place that American Horror Story used as inspiration for the hotel in the season aptly named American Horror Story Hotel. The reason the Cecil was featured on American Horror Story was because this wasn't just a hotel that had encountered some bad luck of being built in the wrong place at the wrong time. It seemed like this hotel had a long history of strange deaths happening inside of its walls that are tracked back as far as the 1930s. The first recorded death to have happened at the Cecil Hotel was Manhattan Beach resident W.K. Norton. A 46-year-old man who checked in under a fake name and a week later, his body was found after he ingested poison. Less than a year later, a 25-year-old man was found by a maid after suffering a self-inflicted gunshot wound. In the summer of 1934, a retired army sergeant cut his own throat with a razor blade in the hotel. In 1937, a woman named Grace Magro either fell 
or was thrown from the window of her hotel room at the Cecil. Her fall was interrupted by various telephone lines and she had to be taken to the hospital where she later died from her injuries. In 1938, a fireman jumped from his room on the top floor of the Cecil Hotel after staying there for several weeks. In the spring of 1939, a 39-year-old Navy officer was found dead in his room after ingesting poison. In September of 1944, a young woman named Dorothy Jean Purcell was staying at the Cecil with a shoe salesman named Ben Levine. She woke up with a horrible stomach ache and went into the bathroom, only to find, to her shock, that she had been pregnant and was now giving birth to a baby. Not wanting to wake up her partner, she had the baby in the bathroom, but claimed the child was a stillborn and threw him out of the window. In November of 1947, another man jumped to his death from a window in the Cecil Hotel. In October of 1954, a 55-year-old woman named Helen Gurney from San Francisco jumped out of her seventh floor window and landed on the hotel's marquee. She had been checked in under a fake name as well. In February of 1962, 50-year-old Julia Frances Moore jumped from a window of her eighth floor room. And later that year, in October of 1962, 27-year-old Pauline Otten jumped out of the window of her room at the Cecil Hotel after having an argument with her husband. She jumped from the ninth floor and she landed on a man who was walking by the hotel. They both died on impact. In December of 1975, a woman who to this day is still unidentified jumped from the window of her 12th floor room after staying at the Cecil Hotel for four days. And it's not just the high occurrences of people taking their own lives, there was murders and other strange occurrences there as well. On June 4th, 1964, a 79-year-old retired telemarketer named Goldie Osgood was attacked, beaten, and assaulted before being stabbed to death in her room at the Cecil. People who knew her called her Pigeon, and she was given this nickname because she was well known in the area for feeding the pigeons in nearby Pershing Square. Hours later, a man was seen walking through Pershing Square in blood-stained clothing and was arrested for her murder, but he was later cleared and released and her violent murder remains unsolved to this day. And in the 1980s, while in the midst of a killing spree, Richard Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker, lived at the Cecil Hotel before he was caught in 1985. There are reports that he would return to the hotel after killing his victims, strip off his blood-stained clothes by the dumpster, toss them in, and then walk into the lobby in his underwear, or sometimes completely naked. When you read about this portion of the story, Richard Ramirez stripping off his clothes, throwing them into the dumpster of the Cecil Hotel before walking into the lobby in his underwear or naked, it's literally explained like this. The Cecil Hotel in the 80s was such a chaotic shit show, essentially, that nobody even raised an eyebrow. Nobody thought that him walking into the hotel naked was strange at all. And that gives you an idea of how far the Cecil Hotel fell from this marble and alabaster oasis to a place where you would literally see people just overdosed in the hallways and serial killers could just walk through the lobby naked without anybody even questioning it or even looking up from their drug of choice at that time. In 1991, an Austrian journalist named Jack Unterweger checked into the Cecil, allegedly working on a story about crime in LA. He used his credentials to get in with the LAPD and to join them on ride-alongs, which he used as scouting missions. Turns out Jack Unterweger, he was a little bit of a disturbed guy, and this is a little detour from the story of Elisa Lam and the Cecil. But it is true crime related and it's super interesting, so just come with me off our beaten path and onto a little side path here for a minute. When he was 25, he went to prison for strangling a German woman with her own bra, but he was a great prisoner. He was a model prisoner. Now keep in mind, guys, he was a model prisoner, but he strangled a woman with her own bra and he was sentenced to life in prison. So while he's in prison, he becomes like this prolific writer and he writes poems and books and an autobiography that is later turned into a movie. The European Arts Committee got behind him and started petitioning for his release. A man who's serving life in prison after strangling a woman with her own bra. And apparently the arts community in Europe at that time had some pull because he did get released after serving only 15 years of a life sentence. But wait, there's more. He didn't just get released like good luck out there. His new popularity got him a new job, a television host. Okay, so I mean, let, let's recap really quick, right? Murderer, life in prison, arts community is like, nah, he's a good guy, he's a good guy. Released after 15 years of a life sentence. 
Now he's got a fancy new job, he's a television host, he's a journalist, and within a year, he's back out on the streets again, strangling women with their own bras. But are any of us really surprised by this? Really? I mean, probably the European arts community was surprised, like, oh man, bad call, but nobody logically could be surprised that this man would go on to kill again after being released from prison. So Jack comes to LA, he's pretending he's a journalist and he's doing a story on the Cecil Hotel and he gets in good with LAPD, he's doing ride-alongs with them. And during his stay at the Cecil Hotel, he took three women's lives. And there's a whole big story behind Jack Unterweiger and if you guys want me to do a video on him, I would love to because it's such an interesting story. So let me know in the comments or maybe I'll put a poll up. Let me know if you want me to do a video on Jack Unterweiger. It might be a nice addition to our serial killers segment, but let's move on. And without fail, whenever you hear a story about the Cecil Hotel, you will hear, without fail, that Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, stayed there in the days before she was killed. And I am here to tell you that there's absolutely no proof or evidence that exists to say that Elizabeth Short ever stayed at the Cecil Hotel or even walked through the doors of its lobby. Now, could she maybe have been there at one point? Maybe she met somebody there for a drink in the years or months before she died, but there's no eyewitnesses who saw her at the Cecil Hotel. There's nothing to prove that she was there in the days before her death, which would connect the Cecil Hotel to her death. But when you talk about Los Angeles in this time period, the 1940s, and you talk about creepy things or haunted hotels, without fail, the Black Dahlia is gonna find herself somehow intertwined with this story, but there's absolutely no proof that that ever happened. And this is the kind of journalism and reporting that drives me crazy because I hate when people report these fabrications as fact. And almost everything I read online about the Cecil Hotel does find a way to weave the Black Dahlia in there because it gives it that Hollywood kind of haunted spooky vibe. And I understand why they do it, but I'm here to set the record straight. No proof, no evidence. Let's move on. So now we come to Elisa Lam, a 21-year-old college student from Vancouver, Canada, who decided to go on a solo trip of the West Coast in January of 2013. Her first stop had been in San Diego, and then she was going to head on to LA, and then Santa Cruz. But unfortunately, Elisa would never make it to Santa Cruz. A few days into her stay in Los Angeles, she disappeared. And weeks later, her body was found in a water tank on the roof of the Cecil Hotel. How did this happen? As always, to understand what happened at the end, we have to go back to the beginning. Alisa arrived in LA on January 26th, and this same day, she made online reservations at the Cecil Hotel. She made a reservation for three nights to check in on January 28th and to check out on January 31st. Now, I looked around online everywhere, and I could find no answer to this, so if any of you know more about this case or have an answer to this, please let me know. Where did Alisa stay between her arrival in LA on January 26th and the day she checked into the Cecil on January 28th. I talked to John Lorden about it and he said, you know, nobody really knows. It may be in the police documents. They may know, they probably do. But we're talking about the LAPD here and we're gonna get more in depth on the LAPD's role in this. So they're not letting anybody else know. They're not releasing that information. Many people have used the Freedom of Information Act to request the Elisa Lam police file. And as far as I know, nobody's ever gotten it. So Elisa was very active online. She was very active on websites like Blogspot and Tumblr. And her social media accounts appear to remain as is. They haven't been taken down. They haven't been edited. They are as they were on the day she died. So you can look through her thoughts and feelings. And on Tumblr, I found a post where she says this. I have arrived in La La Land, and there is a monstrosity of a building next to the place I'm staying. When I say monstrosity, mind you, I am saying as in gaudy. But then again, it was built in 1928, hence the Art Deco theme. So yes, it is classy, but then since it's LA, it went on crack. Fairly certain this is where Baz Luhrmann needs to film The Great Gatsby. Tumblr, unfortunately, has no dates attached to post, which is really stupid in my opinion, just another reason why Tumblr is really stupid. But we can assume that she's referring to the Cecil Hotel when she talks about this monstrosity of a building that was decorated in the Art Deco style. She said it was gaudy, that it was built in 1928, that it had the gaudy Art Deco theme, and this sounds a lot like the Cecil Hotel. So using that information, 
We can only guess that she must have been staying in those two days, someplace close to the Cecil, in a close enough proximity where she could either see the Cecil Hotel from the window of her current hotel, or she was walking by it on a regular basis. And maybe that's what prompted her to get online and make reservations at the Cecil Hotel, being interested in how it looked and wanting to see it on the inside. Maybe after seeing the Cecil Hotel and writing about it online, she did some research on the Cecil Hotel and found out that it has this kind of creepy history. And maybe she kind of wanted to see for herself if the stories about it being haunted was true. So I went on Google Earth and as far as I can tell, there's no hotels directly next to the Cecil. There seemed to be a building right next door to the Cecil that had a pool on its rooftop, but when I looked around it using Google Earth, I couldn't find any signage that said it was a hotel, so it might be an apartment building now, who knows? When I went to LA, I did go to the Cecil Hotel, but I completely forgot to kind of walk around and check to see if there was hotels within walking distance. That would have been a good thing to do, but just giving you the information, the closest hotel looks like it's the Baltimore Hotel which would be about a three minute walk away. Regardless, I wish I knew. I think the police do know. Hopefully one day we'll find out. So Elisa checked in to the Cecil Hotel on the 28th and initially she was assigned to a hostel style shared room with three other people on the fifth floor. But two days later, she was moved to a private room still on the fifth floor. Her roommates had cited odd behavior as the reason for her move, and that's the only way I've ever heard her behavior described by anyone in those two days. There's no interviews with these roommates, no specific things that she said or did, which I personally find odd. Because it doesn't appear that these people that she shared a room with were ever interviewed by police or the press. This was a big case when it broke, and you'd think that the last people who had seen her and who had literally lived with her for two days before she disappeared and ended up in the water tank on top of the hotel, they would have been spoken to. The, the press would have tracked them down at least. Maybe they were long gone by the time her body was found weeks later. Maybe nobody could track them down, but you would think that the police would get the hotel's logbooks and find out who had stayed in the room with her and maybe track them down even if they had traveled to a different country and ask them specifically what it was about Elisa's behavior that was odd. To my knowledge, that never happened. Once again, the police may have done that, they may have it in their report, but we don't know. Now, Elisa was a young girl, and of course, her parents were worried about her traveling alone, especially in a different country, but she insisted to them that this was the way it needed to be. She was a girl who was always searching for something, self-awareness, human connection, answers to all those tough metaphysical questions we have that sometimes keep us up at night. But browsing through her social media, something else stands out. It seems Elisa Lam was struggling with some kind of mental illness. On August 8th of 2010, she wrote in her blog, I've been having headaches for the past two days, and my vision shakes when I stand. I'm not sure if it's vertigo, but I definitely do not feel stable even when sitting. It also gets hard to focus at times. I can't seem to process the whole scene, almost like tunnel vision on a handheld camera. And in April of 2012, she wrote, I spent about two days in bed hating myself. The next month, she wrote, I believe the biggest reason why I got depressed was because I stopped running in my last year of high school. Up until that point, I was on the cross country and track and field team. Mind you, I wasn't a very good runner, but I did it. I lacked the self-discipline to actually train, and now I am still lacking self-discipline to run or do any sport. And throughout that same month, she continued to write about her struggle with her depression, her schoolwork, and her life in general. I feel I am wasting my time compared to my fellow peers. I had a relapse at the start of term and had to drop two of the three courses I was taking. Now I am down to one course and I have missed three weeks of classes since my sleeping pattern is completely reversed. I am a bit defeated because I have far too much free time and no one to spend it with. I'm very disappointed in myself for breaking down during the term, forcing me to withdraw from courses. I've been at university for three years and I've only managed to complete three courses. That means I've been a first year student for three years. I feel so utterly directionless and lost. 
It's likely that this trip to California was an effort for a young girl who felt so very directionless and lost to find direction or to stimulate the creativity she wanted so badly. She loved fashion and posted incessantly about it on Tumblr, but she also was down on herself for not being able to take this passion and do anything more with it than talk about it on social media. She went between feeling very alone and wanting to be alone. She says that she has so much free time and no one to spend it with, but later she would write that being around a lot of people was exhausting. Before she left for California, it seems she had a party where her friends and family could come and say goodbye to her and wish her luck. She wrote online, I had a catch-up reunion with high school slash elementary people and a sort of bon voyage soiree. And I'm fatigued, exhausted, in recovery for throwing it and just seeing so many people and doing so many stupid, idiotic things in the last four days. But I am very full of, I suppose the term would be, as Dumbledore says, love. Because last night was evidence that I do have amazing, beautiful things in my life. And even though everyone is busy and off doing great things, they do care about me. I'm not a professional depressed person. I am so much more than that. And these people are reminders that I am very lucky. Life is long and difficult, and people will always be stupid and complain, but it's worth it as long as you have special moments. There will be lots of these moments in the future and have been a lot in the past. So what if everything is shit and all the plans have gone to hell? If I ask for help, someone might be willing to spare a hand. And this is textbook introvert behavior and thought process. We enjoy being with others. We appreciate that others want to be with us, but we don't like huge social gatherings and we really hate small talk too. It physically and mentally drains us and we have to retreat to a quiet and more peaceful place to recharge. An introvert is given life and energy in those quiet moments where they're able to be creative and write or read or reflect on things. But society is often telling us that being alone is weird and it makes us reclusive and that we should want to be with people and we should want to socialize with as many people as possible because normal humans love social interaction. We're social beings. It causes those of us who prefer to stay at home and be alone or just with a small group of people like our immediate family to feel like we're doing something wrong. And it makes us feel like we should make more of an effort to step outside of our box and do the things that society is saying we should be doing until we actually do them and then we're like, screw this. I don't care if society thinks I'm weird. I'm going back to my house and watching Netflix. And it's honestly very sad because Elisa Lamb was a girl that I could understand and I think a lot of us could understand. And in going through her social media very extensively, I began to feel connected to her. I began to feel like I wanted to reach out to her and give her a hug. And then I remembered I couldn't because she's no longer with us. Elisa had been diagnosed with bipolar depression and it didn't seem like it was something she was coping with well, especially after graduating from high school and starting college. And she says, life is long and difficult and people will always be stupid and complain, but it's worth it as long as you have special moments. There will be lots of these moments in the future. Elisa didn't realize just how short of a time she had left to create and experience these special moments. For Elisa, life would not be long. Because her parents were on the fence about her traveling alone, Elisa promised to call home every day, several times a day. She'd be in constant contact and she'd update them on what she was doing and what she was seeing. And she did until the day of January 31st. A couple of people saw Elisa that day. Katie Orphan, the manager of a store called The Last Bookstore around the corner from the Cecil Hotel, saw and spoke to Elisa on the 31st. Elisa was buying books and records for her family and friends back home, and she chatted with Katie about if her purchases were going to be too much or too heavy to walk around with. Katie said she was lively, happy, and friendly, and she seemed fully intent on going home to give these things to her family. When Elisa's parents still hadn't heard from her and a couple days had passed, they contacted the Vancouver police, who directed them to the LAPD. Then Elisa's parents got on a plane and flew to LA to aid the police in searching for their daughter. Six days after Elisa is last seen, the LAPD gives a press conference to the public. Yesterday, uh, we were made aware of robbery homicide of um missing persons case, Elisa Lamb. Uh, she was last seen on the 31st at the Cecil Hotel at 640 South Main Street. She's a Canadian citizen and the reason that uh, we're investigating this robbery homicide is because 
Uh, we're in connection with Interpol on a regular basis, and any case that involves uh, foreign nationals usually comes to us. Uh, so right now we're asking your help. Uh, we have a photo. Parents are here. They've flown down from Vancouver, and um, we're seeking to get this photo out so we can uh, find Elisa. Uh, again, she's been missing since the 31st and uh, she was down in Los Angeles in our area just basically for leisure, for travel. And uh, we're continuing the investigation now and we're looking for your help. So with that, that's pretty much all I have as far as uh, details on the case. If you have any questions, I can entertain them now. Your news release that got us here said that she vanished under somewhat suspicious circumstances. So what can you say about that? Uh, she was in contact with her parents daily, her family, uh, up until the 31st. So it's been five days, six days now. And uh, as far as suspicious circumstances, nothing other than that, but there's been no communication at all. And uh, that's uh, worried us and worried the family. So we're proceeding with the investigation on that. So the LAPD, the day after they're alerted that Elisa is missing, they give this press conference. They show her picture. They ask for help in finding her or keeping a lookout for her. They ask for people to come forward if they've seen her. He says that she was staying at the hotel. She never checked out and they were in the process of looking through hotel surveillance footage. A reporter asks the question, do you think anybody told her about the Cecil Hotel or warned her about where she was staying? And the police respond, no, we have no reason to believe that she was concerned about where she was staying at all. Well, I don't know if anybody warned her or talked to her about where she was staying and being there alone as a woman in the Skid Row area. No, I don't believe uh, she had any idea that uh, that might be a, a location to be concerned about. The hotel staff who also saw Elisa the day she went missing and in the days leading up to January 31st, they said she was acting completely normal. She wasn't acting odd. She wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary, but they said that she was always alone. They never saw her in the company of anybody else. Next would come the most puzzling piece of the Elisa Lamb mystery and the one that still haunts most of us to this day. The surveillance footage that the police had collected from the hotel was released to the public. I suppose in hopes that someone would recognize her and come forward and say they'd seen her, even though the picture that they put up on the news and the picture they were showing people that her family had given them was a much better likeness of her. The surveillance footage is grainy, not a great picture. You don't really see the features of her face. So even though the police say that's why they released it, I'm not sure. But in this surveillance footage, Elisa's acting very strange. So you can see that the doors to the elevator are opening. She's getting on. She's gonna get really close to the buttons and then she's going to push all of the buttons in the middle row. Now she's gonna stand there and she's going to wait for the elevator door to close, but when it doesn't close, she's going to get confused. She's gonna to creep to the door of the elevator and look out, almost as if she's hoping to catch somebody in the act. But her body language is playful. Some people think she was afraid, the way she hides next to the elevator buttons, as if she thinks she's being followed or if she's running from somebody. She's gonna slowly creep out of the elevator and she's gonna do this little hop thing in a moment. Like I said, it's as if she's playing hide and seek with a child. She's trying to catch somebody, somebody who she thinks may be outside of the elevator, holding the button, keeping the elevator door open. She's standing just outside of the elevator now. She's out of frame for a little bit, but then you can see her pop back into frame and her arm hanging loosely by her side. What is she doing out here? She's lifting her hands to her head, almost as if to say, what is going on? She's out here for quite a while. Is she talking to someone? Is she looking for someone? Does she see someone down the hall who's beckoning to her? Now she's gonna walk back in, holding the elevator doors as if she's losing her balance. She's gonna push the buttons on the elevator again, hoping to make the elevator door close. In my 
my opinion, she appears to be just as confused about what is happening as we are. She once again goes and stands outside of the elevator. And this is when people say her hands and her fingers look strange. They look long, almost non-human. The things she's doing with her hands look strange. And then all of a sudden she starts counting on her fingers. What's she doing with her hands? Why do they look so abnormally long? After standing outside of the elevator for a bit and appearing to have a conversation with someone or herself, Elisa Lamb walks away and she does not come back to the elevator. Did she think the elevator was broken? Did she see somebody who was beckoning to her and asking her to come with them? We don't know. Either way, this was the last time that Elisa Lamb would ever be seen alive. On the news, they described her behavior as bizarre and said that she was acting erratically and that the police had been in the possession of this footage for some time, but they were now making it available to the public because they'd reached a standstill in the investigation. Of course, this video went viral, with everybody speculating about what the heck she was doing in that elevator. Was she drunk? Was she on some sort of hallucinogenic drug? Was she being threatened by somebody else outside of the elevator? Was she being followed? There are so many theories about what she was doing in that elevator, which we will get to in the theories section of this video. But at this point, she's still missing. Nobody knows where she is. There's no clues. There's no leads. And the surveillance footage shows that her night may not have been going normally the night she disappeared. In some legal documents, it is stated that the LAPD conducted an exhaustive and extensive search of the Hotel Cecil. Extensive and exhaustive. Remember those words. They said they did this extensive and exhaustive search of the hotel, of the hotel's roof, over the course of several days starting on February 5th. They set up a command post in the lobby of the hotel and different teams of police officers went through the hotel with a hotel employee that had a key card and checked rooms. They said they searched every nook and cranny. After this, a second search of the hotel was done using canine units, but there was still no sign of Elisa Lamb. So I'm just gonna interject here really quickly. I don't know what the LAPD considered to be an extensive and exhaustive search, but they did not search every single room. They went with a hotel employee who had a key card and they knocked on the doors of people's rooms, but they asked if they could look inside. And if the people said, no, you can't come inside and look, the police couldn't do it or wouldn't do it, even though I feel like they probably could have. They probably only need to go to a judge and say, hey, this girl disappeared here at this hotel. She may be in somebody's room. We need a warrant to search every single room of the Cecil Hotel, all 600. They probably could have done that, but that would have been a lot of work for the LAPD, probably. So they did not check every room, and we know they probably didn't check every nook and cranny of the roof either, because while they were doing their extensive and exhaustive search on the roof, she was in the water tank right there on the roof, and they never looked. They put up posters of her face all over LA. Her parents stayed in LA to get the awareness out and get the word out that their daughter was missing, but none of these things led to her discovery. It would be an ironic and random complaint about water pressure from a guest of the Hotel Cecil that will lead to the discovery of her body weeks later. On February 19th, some hotel guests called the front desk and complained that the water pressure was really weak and there was a strange odor coming from the tap water. Santiago Lopez, a member of the maintenance team at the hotel, headed up to the roof where the hotel's water was supplied by four water tanks. He climbed up the ladder to check them out and that's when he discovered that the main water tank's hatch was open. He looked inside and saw a woman floating on her back about 12 inches from the top of the tank. It was Elisa Lamb, and LAPD was immediately notified. The fire department had to come and drain the tank completely before cutting a section out of the side so it could remove her body. She was completely naked, and in the tank with her, they found the clothes she'd been wearing in that elevator video. One pair of black shorts sized men's medium. One green shirt labeled JJM with a logo on the back that said Alexander Keith's India Pale Ale, sized large. One pair of Calvin Klein black lace underwear, sized small. A pair of black polka dotted sandals. A red American apparel zip up hoodie, sized extra small. Her watch and room key card were also found in the tank. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Let's unpack it quickly. The 
The Cecil is a 15-story building that's shaped like an E, with three separate wings that are connected. On the roof, there are four 1,000-gallon water tanks that supply the hotel with water using a gravity-operated system. Each tank is approximately 10 feet high and 6 feet in diameter, and they're located on a 4-foot platform. So these are huge water tanks, and in order to access them, you'd have to get on to the roof of the hotel, which is a restricted area to hotel guests. Somehow climb up this 4-foot platform, find this ladder that's located in between all of the four tanks and so you're going through like pipes and tubes and all the stuff that's connected to the water tanks in order to get in between all four and find the ladder that allows you to climb up the water tank climb up that ladder and then climb on top of the water tank and open the metal hatch located on the top of the water tank and then for some reason jump inside of this water tank Theoretically, you could also climb onto the elevator maintenance building, which is located next to those four tanks, and then jump down into an open hatch, but you'd have to have some pretty good aim to do that because that maintenance building is pretty high above the tanks. So now that we kind of have a picture of what these water tanks looked like and how difficult it would be to kind of get inside of one, we're gonna go back to Elisa Lam. Obviously, the residents of the Cecil Hotel were having issues with water pressure because there'd been a dead body in one of the water tanks for the better part of two weeks. Two British tourists who'd been staying at the Cecil Hotel, Sabrina and Michael Bow, claimed that the water pressure in the shower was horrible and the water had a funny taste. They also said when you turned on the tap water, it would run black for a couple of seconds before running clear again. You know LA's kinda got a bad rep when it comes to people from other countries. When the people from other countries visit LA and turn the water on and it runs black for a couple seconds and they're like, this is probably just how the water is here. It runs black. So you've got hotel guests and people who actually lived at the hotel, like permanently, drinking and showering and bathing in water that had potentially been contaminated by a corpse for several weeks. Many of the hotel guests checked out, claiming that the hotel hadn't even notified them of the discovery of the body and they had continued to drink the water and use the water. These people had found out by watching the news and the Hotel Cecil continued to take reservations for people to check in. Some of these people who checked in after the fact, after the discovery of the body, claimed allegedly that the hotel never even notified them that there was an issue with the water supply and not to drink it. Now the hotel claims that they did tell people that they said, yeah, we can still take your reservation, but you won't be able to use the water or you know, drink the water for a while. We'll, we'll provide you with bottled water, but who knows what the truth is? Who knows? Why would a 21 year old girl traveling alone go to the roof of a hotel that she's not allowed to be at and jump into a water tank? It seemed initially that everyone thought she'd been put there and there was foul play involved. But then the autopsy was done and her death was ruled to be an accidental drowning with her bipolar disorder being a contributing factor. Now I posted a picture of a page from the autopsy results on my Patreon and I asked my Patreons, what doesn't look right about this? And that's all I said. And most of them figured it out right away. So you can see that initially the cause of death was checked off as unknown could not be determined was checked, but then it was crossed off and accidental was checked. In the autopsy, it also showed that all articles of clothing had some sand-like particulate present on the fabric. There was no evidence of internal or external injuries, and she was described as thin, 122 pounds and about 5'4". A rape kit was done on her and put into evidence, but as far as we know, that kit has never been processed and sits in a backlog at the LAPD crime lab. Now, this is not necessarily saying anything wrong about the LAPD crime lab, and we covered this a lot when we talked about the Crystal Worthington case from Cape Cod. I think that this is the state of many crime labs across the nation. You have so many samples being done, and I don't know if it's just the time that it takes to process them, or a lack of resources, or a lack of, you know, people who are qualified to do the testing, but a lot of these samples just sit in storage and never get tested, which I think is a big problem that should be addressed more on a federal level because this is happening all over the country. And when it comes to rape kits and things like that, you potentially have the DNA of somebody who's just a predator out there attacking people in your storage and you could find out who that is and you could catch him and take him off the streets and make sure he's not doing that to anybody else. But instead, they just sit there under lock and key, and it, it doesn't make sense why. So the opinion section of page 10 of the autopsy essentially states that there was no evidence of trauma, 
Toxicology report showed no acute alcohol or drug intoxication. She had a history of bipolar disorder and depression that she was prescribed medication for, and her blood was checked for the presence of these medications. But apparently, there wasn't enough blood available to them to check for the quantity. Investigation determined no foul play and no intention of self-harm, just a simple accidental drowning. A lot of people say that there's no way Elisa could have gotten onto the roof of the Cecil Hotel and into that water tank by herself. The hotel claims that there's only four ways to gain access to the roof, which is a clearly labeled restricted area. There's a door which leads from the 14th floor of the hotel to the roof and that's always locked and alarmed, allegedly. Only a member of the maintenance team at that hotel would have a key that would unlock that door and the ability to disarm the alarm. Allegedly, according to the Cecil Hotel, when the alarm goes off, it's loud enough to be heard on the 14th and the 15th floors. And the front desk has an additional alarm that when that alarm at the 14th floor door goes off, it alerts the front desk using an alarm connected there. According to the hotel's own words, this alarm was not activated at all during the months of January 2013 in February 2013. So if you believe what the hotel is saying, that the doors locked and alarmed and the alarm did not go off while she was staying there, there would be no way that she could have gained access to the roof through that door. Leaving only the three exterior fire escapes located on the sides of the hotel that run the entire length of the building. Now this is some footage from Google Earth. You can see that these fire escapes are the old fashioned kind. They're actually stairs that run up from the ground all the way to the final floor. And then you would have to climb up a ladder fastened to the side of the building to get the rest of the way up to the roof. Once on the roof, she would have had to have located the ladder between the tanks, go up that and get on top of the tank, open the hatch and jump in. Why would she do that? According to the toxicology report, she wasn't drunk. She wasn't using any hallucinogenic drugs. What would motivate her to jump through so many hoops, climbing up a fire escape, climbing up a ladder, finding another ladder, climbing up that ladder, opening a hatch on the top of the water tank and going for a swim in the water tank? Why? Who makes the decision to go swimming in a, a water tank on the roof of a hotel? And if you believe what the autopsy is saying, that it was accidental, that's really the only reason that she would go up into that water tank and jump in and accidentally drown. She had made the conscious effort to get in the water tank of her own accord. Now there's a lot of misinformation online saying that the water tanks are covered by these heavy lids, and that's true. But these sources online say that there's no way she could have moved that heavy lid and gotten into the water tank and then pulled the heavy lid back over her, which, which is also true. I do believe that. But she didn't need to remove that huge, like six foot, you know, metal lid in order to get into the water tank. There's a hatch, a little door built into the water tank the lid of the water tank that she opened and then she could jump in. And it was, you know, probably not a big opening, probably like this big, but she could have fit through it. And when she was found, this door to the little hatch on top of the water tank was open, which is why when the maintenance man came up to the roof to check specifically on the water tanks, he checked that water tank first because the hatch was open. The tank was said to have been about one half to one third of the way full, which is why after she jumped into the tank, allegedly, if she did jump into the tank, she wouldn't have been able to reach back up and close that hatch door because the water level was too low. And that's probably why she wouldn't have been able to get out of the water tank as well. But my question is, if the police claim to have extensively and exhaustively searched every nook and cranny of this hotel and its roof, why did they not notice that the hatch door was open on the water tank? Allegedly, according to reports, the police claimed that when they searched the roof, they didn't go anywhere near the water tanks. That's why they didn't see the door was open. Which leads me to point out, LAPD, that's not every nook and cranny, not by far. It's believed that the water tanks were too high being on that four foot platform for the police to have been able to see the water tank door opened from their place on the roof. And I'm not sure if that's true. I wish I could get up to the Cecil Hotel's roof and open a water tank hatch and then stand down on the, on the roof part and see if I can see it. Another reason might be that the door to the hatch on top of the water tank wasn't left open. And since a hotel employee discovered her body, he said it was left open or the hotel told him to say that it was left open. So it looked as if she'd gotten in on her own because if that little hatch had been closed, 
it would have been clear that there'd been another party involved. So I'm just saying that's a possibility, that's speculation of why the police may not have seen the hatch door open from their position on the roof because maybe it had been closed and then the hotel just fabricated the story of it being open to make it look as if it was more of an accident than anything else. But once again, that's just my opinion, just my speculation, just my conspiracy, don't come for me. Then there's a question of the sand-like particulate found in most of her clothing. When she was found, she was naked and most of her clothes were found in the tank with her. Some people believed she undressed herself in the tank due to hypothermia. And this is very similar to the Kanika Jenkins case when she was in the freezer and it looked as if her clothes were all in disarray. People believe that she was taking off her own clothes. I think it's called paradoxical undressing. It means when you're very, very cold, your body reacts and almost makes you feel like you're really, really hot. So you take off your clothes instead of trying to cover up, which would help you with the hypothermia more. However, I don't agree with this. LA, it can get really cold at night and you know in January and February I assume it would be getting colder at night um, but I don't know if it would have been cold enough in that tank to cause hypothermia my theory is it's more likely that if she went into the tank when she was still alive she would have tried to remove her clothing while she was trying to stay afloat knowing it was weighing her down so as her clothing got wet and it gets heavier when it gets wet she probably took it off so that she could stay afloat for longer hoping that help would come or hoping that she'd figure out a way out of this tank. But everything together, the weird elevator video, the difficulty of getting up onto the roof and into these water tanks, the inconsistencies in the autopsy, and how even though there seems to be evidence and leads that haven't been investigated yet, with very little follow-up from the LAPD, they have ruled her death an accidental death and they've left it at that. So let's talk about some possible theories. Okay, so theory number one is that she was murdered, whether it be by someone she knew, a hotel guest, or a hotel employee, people believe she was murdered. Many internet detectives have made claims that there are multiple registered sex offenders living full-time at the Cecil Hotel. Personally, I could not find any evidence that led to such conclusions, but at the time of her death, there were 100 full-time residents living at the Cecil Hotel. Some believe it was an employee of the hotel, someone who was able to gain roof access and brought her up there with him or her. The fact that her clothes had this sandy-like particle or substance on them suggested that they'd been off of her before she went into the tank. A sand-like substance like that particulate was found on the floor of the roof. So it's hard because I said the floor of the roof, but there's no ceiling over the roof and roof and floor are such opposing ideas, but the top of the roof where your feet would walk. So if her clothes had been taken off and placed on the roof, they would have had to have been thrown in after her, after she went into the tank. So basically the theory that she might've taken her clothes off while she was in the tank would only work if she had taken her clothes off and rubbed them all over the roof and then put them back on, or if she had rolled around on the roof, I guess, while she was still dressed before getting into the water tank. Theory number two suggests that Elisa wasn't taking her meds as prescribed, and this caused her to have some sort of psychotic break, which made her act strangely in the elevator and do something seemingly without any reason, like going up to the roof of a hotel and jumping into a water tank. Once she was in there, she would have realized that there was no way to get back out. She couldn't reach the entrance to the water tank that she'd come through and she would have called for help, hoping somebody would hear her and get her out. But there was nobody around to hear her, and eventually she got too tired to continue swimming. After her death, Elisa's parents filed a wrongful death suit against the Cecil Hotel, and it seems to be that they believed Elisa was off her meds and went in there on her own. However, they believed the hotel was responsible for not protecting its residents. There were no cameras on the 14th floor hallway to show if there was anyone following Elisa while she was in the elevator. There were no cameras on the roof. The door to the roof was allegedly not locked, but alarmed, and the water tanks were not locked either, making it easy for someone to fall into them. A judge dismissed this suit, finding in favor of the Cecil Hotel. Apparently, they had done all they could to make it clear that hotel guests were not allowed to be on the roof. However, I would like to point out in these court documents, the head of the maintenance department, who is said to have worked there for over 30 years, claims that he does a weekly inspection of the roof and the water tanks. But at the same time, he says he has no knowledge that any hotel guests have ever been on the roof. 
Number one, if you went up there weekly and you checked out the roof and the water tanks, you would have noticed that the door, the hatch door, was open on one of the water tanks. And Elise may have still been alive, or maybe she would have been found long before three weeks after going missing. Secondly, there's graffiti all over that roof, including on the water tanks. And this graffiti is dated. The only way that graffiti would get onto the roof and the water tank is if people were going up there who shouldn't be up there. So I have a hard time believing that the Cecil Hotel had no idea that some of their guests would go up to the roof. In fact, there are several people who have come forward saying that while they stayed at the Cecil Hotel, they used to go up to the roof all the time and like smoke or do drugs, do graffiti. It was like a hangout spot. Additionally, since the death of Elisa Lamb, many people have gone and stayed at the Cecil Hotel and showed with video proof how easy it really was to get up to the roof. However, this seems to be the theory that most people who don't spend a ton of time looking into the case and all of its details believe. A psychiatrist from Columbia University claimed that based on the video, Elisa appeared to be having a psychotic episode. He says she seems paranoid, preoccupied, as if she's looking for someone. The way she presses all those buttons in the middle row and the bizarre hand movements, those are all hallmark signs of someone who is going through a psychotic episode. The medicines she was prescribed, if taken incorrectly, could have caused such an episode. In the toxicology report, we can see that it looked as if Elisa only took one of her antidepressants that day. Her second antidepressant and her mood stabilizer had been taken recently, but not that day. And the antipsychotic that she was supposed to be taking, she hadn't taken that recently at all. All of her medications that she'd been prescribed were designed to work in harmony, but if she omitted one or took too much of one or too little of one, it could throw her whole body and brain chemistry off. That could have caused the odd behavior her roommates were talking about and her bizarre behavior in the elevator. Then there are the theories that don't answer any questions. They just make more. Theory number three centers around the Lam Eliza TB test. On February 21st, 2013, the LA Times reported the biggest outbreak of TB in Los Angeles in over a decade, and the disease seemed to have focused itself on Skid Row, right around the corner from the Cecil Hotel. Besides the fact that this seems to have happened within days of her body being found, what does it have to do with Elisa? Well, apparently the testing kit used to test the urine of someone to determine if they have TB is called Lam Elisa. No joke, spelled the same way in everything. And get this, the company who produces these urine tests, My Biosource, was founded in 2006 in Vancouver, the same place Elisa went to school. Some people thought that this was too much of a coincidence, and I have to admit, it's creepy. Some thought maybe she was sent there to LA to infect the homeless population there with TB. They were becoming such a problem for the city, maybe there was somebody who had an interest in seeing their populations reduced. Others thought her death was a plant, so the TB outbreak would go overlooked. This way, if anybody Googled Lam Elisa, like the testing kit for TB, it would pop up with Elisa Lam's death, not the TB outbreak on Skid Row. Some people say her death was faked and she was still alive. They just faked her death in order to cover up this tuberculosis spreading through Skid Row in LA, and she's still alive out there somewhere. And people point to her Tumblr account as proof of this. As an older person and someone who doesn't use Tumblr, I had to turn to an expert for this because I, I admit it was very creepy to see that her Tumblr was still being posted posted to months after she died. So I asked my 18 year old daughter, if there's any way that you could almost have something post automatically to Tumblr, or if there's a certain person you follow on Tumblr, every time they post, you have it automatically posted to your Tumblr account, because all the things that were being shared after her death just seemed to be reposts. My daughter said, not really, but you can schedule posts. So her blog on Tumblr is named Nouvelle Nouveau, and I'll link it in the description box if you wanna check it out. So you'd have to go into archive, and then you can kind of get an idea of when these things were posted. So if she died in late January or early February of 2013, you'd expect to see all posts after like February 1st of 2013 not be happening anymore, right? Her not posting to Tumblr anymore. But you do see posts in these months. You see a ton of posts in February, posts in March, posts in April, June, and so on. 
Well, what Nev told me, my daughter, is that you can schedule posts to go up at certain times. So Elisa most likely scheduled a bunch of reposts to go live in February. And that's why you see a drastic reduction in the number of posts as the months go on. In February, there's probably like 50. And then in um, March, there's only four. In April, there's only three. In June, there's only one. And then in December of 2013, there's one again. So then I started to ask Nev, well, is there a way you can post these posts for specific days? Because you've got a big gap between June of 2013 and December of 2013. And Nev told me to look at the picture posted in December, which I did. And she said, is it Christmassy? And I said, yes, it is. It's a light bulb with a Christmas tree in it and snow. And Nev said, well, sometimes people, if they come across like a holiday kind of Tumblr post, they will schedule it for December or around Christmas time. So then it'll post then. So pretty much that explains the whole mystery of why Elisa Lamb's Tumblr is still being posted to. I don't think there's anything strange going on there at all. The people who believe that Elisa Lamb's death was faked also believe that Elisa and her family and everybody in her life that knew her essentially are paid actors. I definitely don't believe that Elisa Lamb's parents are paid actors. Um, they, they definitely came to LA when Elisa went missing. There's a real live lawsuit against the Cecil Hotel that's in their names. So I don't think that they're fake people. Um, I definitely don't believe at all that Elisa's death was faked or that she's still sitting on Tumblr posting under her old account because that would make no sense if she was trying to hide and not be found out to be a fake. Theory number four is the dark water angle. So there's this movie called Dark Water. The original was a 2002 film from Japan and the American remake came out in 2005. So the movie's story is about a young girl named Natasha who drowned in a rooftop water tank of an apartment building. A few years later, a woman and her daughter, Cecilia, move into this apartment building and the spirit of Natasha haunts them. Okay, so here's the strange coincidences between Elisa Lam and the movie Dark Water, in case you're interested. First, the daughter's name in the movie was Cecilia and Elisa Lam died at the Cecil Hotel. Obviously, the fact that a young girl died in a water tank on top of an apartment building is very similar. And in the 2005 version of the movie, the mother is standing in the elevator and the camera is capturing her from the same angle and essentially the same position as Elisa was in her elevator footage. The movie shows the young girl accessing the roof through a door that was supposed to have been locked. Elisa is wearing a red hooded sweatshirt. Natasha, when she fell into the water tank, is wearing a red jacket. And Cecilia is also wearing a red shirt throughout the whole movie. The elevator scene in both dark water movies seems to match very closely to the way Elisa was acting in the elevators. So I guess supporters of this theory believe that somebody was using Elisa to act out this scene from dark water. And I always did think it was weird because she was a pretty small girl. I think she was like 112 pounds, 5'4". Her underwear was a size small. Her hoodie was a size extra small. But the other clothes that she was wearing, the men's shorts were a size medium and the, uh, the t-shirt was a size large. And I don't know if anybody's ever been able to prove that these items of clothing actually belong to her. The shorts were actually men's shorts. So was she at first playing along with someone? recreating this movie willingly until it got out of hand and it got serious. Her behavior in the elevator does at times suggest a certain flirtation or playfulness with someone who might be outside of the elevator. As if she's a little kid playing peekaboo. And since there's no camera in that hallway, we will never know. Theory number five is the elevator game. Her actions in that elevator were the most strange and bizarre part of the case that most people still talk about to this day. Why did she push all those buttons in the middle row? Why didn't the doors close? Why did her fingers look so long and distorted at points in that video? Turns out Elisa Lam wasn't wearing her glasses and she didn't have really great vision. And as a fellow blind girl, I can relate. So she most likely had to get really close to those elevator buttons to figure out which one was floor five where her room was. And since the number five would have been located in the middle row of those buttons that she pushed, she may have just pushed down the row, remembering that five was in that row, but not remembering exactly where it was, figuring that she could get off as the elevator doors opened and kind of look out and see if her room was there. But as she was pushing down that middle row of buttons, she most likely accidentally and unknowingly hit the hold button, which would have kept the elevator doors open, which would have confused her considering she wouldn't have known that she pushed it. 
which would have prompted her to look outside of the elevator to see who was pushing the button from the outside, keeping it open. When she didn't see anybody out there, she maybe thought that someone was playing games with her or like trying to prank her. And that's why she kind of bounced out and in from the elevator trying to catch that person in the act. As for her fingers and why they looked so distorted, the whole video has been altered. The timestamp is so unclear and corrupted, there's no way to really tell what it says. This could be because the hotel was using a very old surveillance system, or it could be that while the video was being reviewed by either the Cecil Hotel or the LAPD, the video was edited and the timestamp was altered so it couldn't be read. Why would the video be edited so that the timestamp was unreadable before it was released to the public? Most likely because, once again, either the hotel or the police didn't want us regular everyday people to see that there were time jumps in that video. And there do appear to be specific parts in the video where pieces are missing, as well as areas where the video's speed is changed. Why is this? Well, possibly someone may have walked past the elevator door, another hotel guest may have walked past the open elevators, being caught by the camera inside the elevator, and since that person had nothing to do with the case, and for privacy reasons, they removed that portion so that their identity wouldn't have been revealed, or the hotel, or the police, or both don't want us to see something that's on that video or someone. Anytime something creepy happens in an elevator, the elevator game is brought up. I looked up the rules to the elevator game, which is supposed to transport you to another dimension, and they are as follows. First, the prospective player must choose a building with at least 10 accessible floors and locate an elevator that can be used without anyone else trying to get on it at the same time. The player will then enter the elevator from the first floor, but absolutely must be completely alone. Once in the elevator, the player must visit each of the following floors in exactly this order, pressing the next button just after arriving at each. 4, 2, 6, 2, 10, Five, one. Upon pressing the button to once again return to the first floor, if the elevator begins to move up instead of down, then the ritual has been successful and the next floor the player arrives at will be the portal to another dimension. However, if the elevator obeys and begins descending to the first floor, the player must exit the elevator and the building as quickly as possible and not, for any reason, look back. So some other things about the elevator game. This one paragraph says, a woman may enter on the fifth floor, but do not acknowledge her, which scared the crap out of me. The article goes on to say that players who have spoken to or even looked at the woman claims she got hostile and she would begin haunting their dreams. It says, if the ritual carries out properly, when exiting onto the 10th floor, it should have a cast of darkness and a faint red glow coming from nearby windows. However, nearly all players describe how they are completely alone in this other dimension with the woman from the fifth floor, if she entered the elevator, refusing to explore with them. Some also report it as incredibly dark and the heavy air is suffocating. Many things can go wrong in the other dimension. Players who choose to exit the elevator at the 10th floor believe walking in a straight line makes it easier to return to the correct elevator door to go home but some sources say this isn't the case. Many people brave enough to exit the elevator have reported how the closer they walk back towards the elevators, the farther away they seem to get, while others claim the air becomes incredibly thick, unbearably so, causing them to become disoriented and have trouble discerning similar elevator doors. Allegedly, if a player faints while playing this game, they will find themselves waking up back in their home, except it's not the same home they left. One player thought she made it home before passing out, but then realized she'd woken up in another world. It says, if you do make it back to the real world, players have reported dreaming about this other dimension. Others have said some unknown entity followed them back home, and others say they began seeing things afterward that weren't actually there. So honestly, this seems like a lot of work to go to a place that just sounds awful. Awful. Nothing good happens there. Nothing good happens when you get back. Why would anyone want to do this? Why? Can you guys answer me? Has anybody played this? Why would anybody want to do this? It sounds horrible. Elisa wasn't playing the elevator game, guys. There's a lot of weird stuff surrounding this case, but this ain't it. So much is suspicious, and as much as I'd love to believe the LAPD, this was just an accidental death, there's too many unanswered questions. Why was the cause of death changed 
on the autopsy report three days before it was published. Why would Elisa go into these tanks? And if she did, why was there a sandy particulate all throughout her clothes? Why was the elevator video edited before showing it to the public? Why has her cell phone never been found or even had the confirmation of its existence confirmed? Now, it's said that Elisa had two phones around this time. She had uh, probably a regular flip phone, which would, would have been her cell phone. And then she had borrowed a friend's cell phone, most likely a smartphone so that she could take pictures and post them to, to Tumblr and social media and stuff while she was in LA and in California. Apparently she lost her friend's phone at some point after she arrived in California, but she would have still had her own phone. That's how she was calling her parents every day. So where did this phone go? What was in it? Who did she talk to? Who did she call? The police have this information, but we don't. The only time the LAPD mentions anything about her phone is when they're asked in the press conference, like, what about her phone? And the police officer responds, I don't wanna talk about the phone right now. What was on the phone? Where did she stay before checking into the Cecil Hotel? Why was her behavior only ever described as odd by these roommates and never elaborated by anybody else who talked to these roommates? Was she alone? Had she met someone in LA while she was there? Was there an employee who'd befriended her and told her that they liked to go swimming in the water tanks and tricked her into getting in there? This is one of those cases where we will always have more questions than answers, I think. And I do think the police know more. I think that that's definitely suspicious. I think it's a little strange that nobody seems to be able to get her police file from the Freedom of Information Act because the case is technically closed, so we should be able to get that stuff. I think it's strange also that a young girl from Vancouver who was traveling alone could turn up dead on the roof of a hotel in a water tank and the police would so quickly write it off as accidental without checking into it further. Does it have something to do with the Cecil Hotel's dark past or the Cecil Hotel being haunted? That's another theory. A lot of people think that the ghost of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, did this to her and he's still harassing women in the hotel. A lot of people think it could just be the angry spirits of the people who died at the Cecil Hotel taking out their revenge on innocent people staying there now. Personally, not that I don't believe in ghosts or the unknown, because I do, I don't think that that's the case here. But it is definitely creepy to think of some unseen presence putting Elisa maybe into a trance and leading her up the fire escape, up the ladder, up onto those water tanks and convincing her or compelling her to go into those tanks. Because I feel like you'd have to be on something or hypnotized to ever think it's a good idea to jump into a water tank and take a swim, especially when you're alone. Doing stupid things like that, I guess, is more understandable if you're with a couple of friends and you've been drinking, but just to be alone and to do that, it doesn't make any sense. What I do believe and what I do know is Elisa was a girl who might have had some issues and she might have been going through some stuff, but she had a good heart and she was looking forward to life and her future. She struggled with the stuff we all struggle with. Why am I doing this with my life? Why does it seem like everyone has it more together than I do? Why does it seem so hard for me but so easy for everyone else? Why am I always sad? Why do I have so many ideas but all I do is lay in bed and binge watch The Office on Netflix? Elisa was a normal girl who worried about normal things. She didn't like her legs, so she hated wearing skirts. But she loved fashion, so she wished she could wear more skirts. She talked about wishing she could be more active, but she always made excuses of why she couldn't get to the gym. Although I certainly think there's something about this case that we don't know. I don't think there's anything supernatural going on here. The Cecil Hotel has a dark past, and some have reported feeling this pressing down on them while they stay there. But a negative energy doesn't put you in a water tank. A person did that, whether it was of her own free will, out of sorts from being off her meds, or if it was someone else who knew the hotel well enough to evade the surveillance cameras, we may never know. I definitely think the most likely explanation, if you looked at me and pointed at me and said, tell me what happened, I'd probably say she was off her meds, her body chemistry, her brain chemistry was skewed, she didn't know what she was doing, she didn't have impulse control, and she did this to herself. If I had to say it, not to take her own life, 
but maybe she just thought it would be fun to swim in a water tank. She was feeling stuck in a rut back home. College wasn't going well. She was feeling like everybody else was living their life and doing cool things and she wasn't. So maybe she had FOMO. She sees these stupid girls on Instagram going to Chernobyl and posing at the site where a nuclear reactor exploded and multiple people lost their lives and there's still radiation present there today. These idiot girls on Instagram that do this stuff or she sees people posing on a mountaintop and watching the sunset, or she sees people, you know, surfing in the ocean. And she says, I wanna do something spontaneous. I wanna do something crazy. I wanna do something that I can tell people back home. I wanna live my life, be spontaneous, be spur of the moment, have fun. And maybe she thought that jumping into that water tank and having a quick swim would give her something interesting to go home and tell her family, and it would make her feel alive. I don't know, man, but there's a lot of great online resources you can look into for all of these theories if you're interested in investigating them further. Like I said, John Lorden has an entire playlist for Elisa Lam, and he's done an amazing job getting all the information into that playlist. But before we go, remember what Elisa Lam said. Life is long and difficult, and people will always be stupid and complain, but it's worth it as long as you have special moments. There will be lots of these moments in the future, and have been a lot in the past. So what if everything is shit and all the plans have gone to hell? If I ask for help, someone might be willing to spare a hand. Having issues in life is normal. Feeling depressed sometimes, feeling anxious sometimes, feeling sad, feeling as if you're not accomplishing everything that you know you can, this is completely normal. We all go through it. Not everybody talks about it. Not everybody admits it we've all been there. And even though Elisa didn't get to live the full and happy life I'm sure she would have, we all still can. We're still here. And we have to remember that there's going to be lots of these special moments in life. There have been special moments in the past, there will be in the future. And if you need something, or if you're in trouble, you just have to ask, because there might be somebody out there who will lend you a hand. And she was completely right about that. This community here is full of people who are supportive, uplifting, positive, intelligent, kind, and wonderful human beings. So if you're feeling the way that Elisa was feeling and you need someone to talk to, just put it in the comments. We're all here for you. We are all here for you. And we can make our own special moments here together as a community. Thank you guys so much for being here. I wanna give some birthday shout outs before we go for Patreon. Jamie L's birthday is going to be on October 29th. Samuel's birthday is going to be on October 24th. Courtney Waters is having her birthday on October 19th. Sean Dell Young's birthday is on October 20th. Sally Drazzy's birthday is on October 22nd. Sarah Wardlow's birthday is on October 28th. Gina Ricard's birthday is on October 23rd. Lightning SFM is going to have a birthday on October 21st. Tara Hayes' birthday is on October 31st, a Halloween baby. Fanny Brew from France has a birthday on October 30th. Veronica Hoover's birthday is going to be on October 24th. Becky Weekman's birthday is going to be on October 16th. Eva M has a birthday on October 29th. And Eva, I tried to pronounce your last name five times and I butchered it so badly. I thought it would be a better birthday gift to you if I just didn't try it all. Phoenix Thrasher's birthday is also on October 29th. Thank you as always to my patrons, every single one of you, whether your birthday's this month or in September or in January or in February, I don't care, I love you all, you're amazing. It's because of you that I'm able to do as much as I do. And happy birthday out there to anybody in the community who has an October birthday. Birthdays are fun, we should celebrate them as often as possible for the whole month if you want, for the whole week at least. Thank you guys so much for being here. I will see you next time. Stay kind and stay beautiful and stay spooky. Bye. Oh, I wanted to show you something I got. Okay, so I don't know if you guys have AirPods, but I thought this would be cool if you do have AirPods for the Halloween season. Cause you know I love Halloween. I love all things Halloween and I had to get a Halloween AirPod holder. So it's a pumpkin, right? And then it opens up and your AirPods are inside. <laughs> Isn't it cool? I love it so much. I love it so much. Ew, my AirPods, my AirPod case is dirty. I need to clean it. Ugh. What is that? Stephanie Harlow is canceled. Anyways, they have a ton of these actually. I got Nev one with like lemons on it and I got myself another one for when Halloween's over. It's like shaped like a Game Boy. And I like that they're kind of soft and like if they drop, it protects them. But they're pretty inexpensive. You can find them on Amazon. And I'll put a link for this one here in the description box. If you use that link, I do get a small commission because I'm an Amazon affiliate, but I would never ever recommend anything to you guys that I didn't think was the coolest ever because you would buy it and then figure out that it sucked. 
and then you'd be mad at me. So, and it's like pretty big, so it's easy to find and easy to hold. I'm always losing my AirPods at the bottom of my purse. I can never find them. Okay, I'm really done now. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay spooky, and I'll see you next time. Bye.